Good evening. Thank you for uh, your patience again. Uh, my name is Michael Rooks. I'm a really family curator of contemporary modern art, and it's a joy to be in our galleries tonight. Uh, I want to introduce the program from the museum this evening, just to give you a sense of how glorious this exhibition here at the High Museum is. Uh, tonight's program is part of our Conversations with Contemporary Artists series, which is supported by the Jane F. and Clayton F. Jackson Conversations with Contemporary Artists Endowment. The exhibition we're discussing is Julie Meritu, which was organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Major support for the exhibition is provided by the Ford Foundation and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. The exhibition is made possible here in Atlanta by our premier exhibition sponsors, Delta Airlines Incorporated, and our exhibition series sponsor, Northside Hospital, as well as premier exhibition series supporters, the Antonori Foundation, Sarah and Jim Kennedy, Louis Sams and Jerome Griot, and Wish Foundation, as well as benefactor exhibition series supporters, Ancox Chambers Foundation, and Robin and Hilton Howell, as well as our other generous supporters. I'd also like to thank the members of the High Museum who are in attendance this evening. Your support is invaluable and fuels our mission. Without you, we can't do what we do here at the museum. And if you're not yet a member or if you need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program and um, get your membership to the museum. We'll save time at the end of the program for questions. Uh, so if you do have a question, please type it into the chat room here in Zoom and we'll select the questions from there. Tonight, we're privileged to be joined by Julie Maratu, Christine Y. Kim, and Rejeko Hockley. Kim is Curator of Contemporary Art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Before her appointment at LACMA in 2009, she was Associate Curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Hello. At LACMA, Kim has organized numerous exhibitions, including Isaac Julian Playtime in 2019 and James Terrell's Retrospective, which won Best Monographic Museum Exhibition nationally from the U.S. chapter of the International Association of Art Critics. She's also recently the co-curator of the 12th Gwangju Biennial in South Korea, which I had the pleasure of seeing. At Studio Museum uh, in Harlem, Kim's exhibitions included Black Belt in 2003, which was the museum's first exhibition to present work by Asian diasporic artists on the topic of cross-cultural and racial solidarity. She also co-organized the now legendary exhibitions Freestyle and Frequency with Studio Museum director Thelma Golden, as well as Flow, uh, which she curated uh, in 2008. Kim's also the founding member of Gyopo, uh, an LA-based coalition of diasporic Korean cultural producers and our professionals, generating cultural, political, and professional exchange through community, um, and uh, through which they interrogate discourses in art, criticism, media, and politics. Next, Rujeko Hakli has been a uh, assistant curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art since 2017, where she has curated exhibitions such as Toyin Oji Odutola, To Wander Determined with Melinda Lang, and An Incomplete History of Protest, selections from the Whitney's collection from 1940 to 2017. Hockley began her career at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she was a curatorial assistant and was mentored by Christine. In 2012, she joined the Brooklyn Museum as assistant curator where she co-curated with Catherine Morris, uh, an exhibition titled, We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 85, which examined the political, social, cultural, and aesthetic priorities of women of color during the emergence of second wave feminism. And it was the first exhibition to highlight the voices and experiences of women of color, distinct from the primarily white middle-class mainstream uh, feminist movement. Finally, Julie Meritu, uh, who emigrated as a child at the age of seven to the U.S. with her family from Ethiopia, first arriving in the southeast here in Alabama, but uh, quickly moving on to the Midwest, where she grew up in East Lansing, Michigan. Now based in Harlem, 
Meritu is venerated for her paintings, often monumental in scale, as well as drawings and prints that refer to the history of art, architecture, and ideas, while also addressing the most immediate conditions of contemporaneity, including migration, revolution, climate change, global capitalism, and technology. Her work uh, has been included in some of the most important international exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale uh, in 2019, last year, Documenta 13 from 2012, the Sharjah Biennial, Prospect One uh, in our uh, neck of the woods in New Orleans, New Orleans in 2008, the Whitney Biennial, the Carnegie International, the Istanbul Biennial in 2003, and the Busan Biennale in Busan, South Korea. And that's just a few uh, of the exhibitions. Additionally, her list of honors include the prestigious National Medal of Arts, which was awarded by Secretary of State John Kerry in 2015, the Barnett and Annalee Newman Award, the Berlin Prize, and the MacArthur Prize. And I would be remiss not to uh, mention that she was named last month by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world of 2020. So, <laughs> to throw that in there, because how many billions of people are there on the planet? I mean, man. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me one moment. And um, just we'll go into the exhibition via uh, PowerPoint. And uh, for those of you watching, our exhibition opens to the public on the 24th, uh, which is the Saturday, closes at the end of January uh, of next year and is in our cousin's uh, special exhibition galleries in the Wheeling Pavilion. And uh, the, the exhibition is organized chronologically. Uh, so we're gonna kind of loosely go according to chronology here. Um, and uh, I'll run through a few slides uh, that describe the first gallery. So uh, to open our conversation, um, again, uh, this exhibition is a mid-career retrospective, but it, also relates to the general notion of determining one's positionality in a world that seems to be coming apart at the seams. So uh, a, a big question to throw out to the three of you was, was this idea of positionality part of the conceptual framework of the exhibition from the start, or did it gain a sense of urgency as the exhibition was developed? You're starting with the big questions, Michael. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna ease into it. Um, first of all, thank you, Michael, for for the introduction. Um, I think I speak for all three of us when we say it's such an honor to have this show at the High Museum of Art. And I'll also say um, there was so much interest among incredible museums um, in North America to take this show, and it was very um, deliberate and considered. Um, that it, of the the venues that it came to, in addition to the co-organizers, LACMA and the Whitney. Um, of course, the high, because you have this extraordinary painting, um, Mo, the, one of the four Obama paintings, as well as being such a center for Black history and culture. Um, and the Walker, where the show will travel to after the Whitney in the fall of 2021, um, Julie grew up in the Midwest. All four of these cities um, have high immigrant populations. And we wanted to make sure that the exhibition traveled and was accessible to as, as many people as possible and not just in Los Angeles and New York. So um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Rand Suffolk, High Museum and people of Atlanta for hosting this exhibition. Um, as far as positionality goes, I mean, I think that there's always a, an interesting positionality in Julie's work, but maybe the part that I'll just start with to kind of launch the conversation is um, the uh, the sort of origins of this exhibition, and I'll speak anecdotally. Um, is you know Julie came out to Los Angeles with her family in 20, 2012, 2013. She had just finished the Mogama paintings that were featured at um, Do at Documenta that year, and the James Terrell retrospective um, of which you spoke in the introduction, Michael, was up, and we went through that exhibition very, very slowly and carefully. And the way that I had done this was that each installation, of course, these are immersive light installations, had a label and it had a recommended amount of time to be in that installation. And it wasn't to force people, but it was really because 
it takes a certain amount of time for the retina to respond to the light and for the kind of optical effects to, to take place. And really um, the, the kind of two things of this work to remember in relation to kind of where Julie and I got to starting to talk about the show was one um, kind of perception as the medium, right? How we perceive painting, how we perceive space as the viewer um, and for her as the artist. And then also like this, the thingness of light or the thingness of existence, of experience, of perceiving, of beholding um, a, a work of art. And in that sense, the question immediately came in relation to painting of kind of how do we behold painting in this way? How do we hold it physically, spatially, temporally? And how does one hang a show, especially the scale um, at which Julie's works often are, um, to be sort of enveloped in one of these paintings and then to what would it kind of look like, feel like, be like, to then have an entire arc of, you know, in the show, I think it's nearly 75 works of art. Um, and what does kind of, what is that relationship or the potential of that relationship with the viewer? And so I guess, you know, to just sort of move into that question of, of positionality, I start there as thinking um, from the very beginning about the, the viewer in the world that he or she or they may be in um, within landscape, within a museum space, within approaching painting um, as something that, of course, you know, maybe Julie can talk about in the work itself, but, um, but is, is hugely important in the practice and the experience of the work. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, point. Um, I also just want to take one quick second, although Christine said thank yous for us, to just thank you again for this opportunity and for making sure that during this kind of time, the show still is moving forward and being exhibited at the high. So I'm very grateful to that, to both um, to the entire team there. Thank you all. Um, also, just to add that there are a lot of Curators only get to do so many shows in their career and time, and it takes an immense amount of work. Christine and I have been working together maybe six years. Rue and I, Rue came on um, in the middle of the game and in, in the middle of it and has been putting a lot of energy into this. So I just want to give a lot of, uh, of my gratitude to that amount of time and consideration and, and the depth of scholarship you both did with the work. I appreciate that's an immense honor for any artist. Um, just to add to what you're saying about positionality, but also about experience, the time-based experiential kind of issue with painting. I think right now more than ever, painting is, um, in, we, we consume so many images in a on a daily level, like within the um, aspect of the way everything is so mediated, especially um, in terms of social media and the quickness at which images are, are scrolled through. And we, under, we make sense of the world and where we are and who we are through these, Meet very di digitally media mediated experiences um, that happen very quickly. Where and painting is a very slow experience. It's a time-based experience. It takes um, it. it ta and this is what I was really moved by with the Terrell show is that you, in order to fully get the the piece, you had to actually spend a certain amount of time in there for your eyes and for your retina to get used to it. That's the same thing with a painting. You can look at a painting for a minute or two, but that doesn't mean you really have the experience of the painting. The, the painting evolves and shifts and moves and interacts with the body very differently. And this doesn't necessarily, is not limited to abstract painting. You can think about Rembrandt's Night Watchman and have that experience where the actual three dimensionality of that painting comes into gear and you all of a sudden notice um, the shadow reaching over the, the other soldier's crotch in a way that you would never have noticed it, it, at first, that that happens over time and over the experience of really met, sitting and being with that painting and experiencing what happens in your what happens to the eye and what happens in the retina. So I think like um, that's a really key part of how we thought about this show and how I and but also how I approach painting and thinking around painting and making painting, and especially with the Mogamas, that was a really important part for how I was how I was trying to really think of these paintings as not um, some kind of narrative or prescriptive kind of image, but uh, that one, but really this experiential type of, 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 of experience or, you know, it's kind of redundant, but you know what I mean? Like it, it becomes this, the experience of seeing the painting is the moving experience and that's a time-based experience. And with Mogama, Mogama is, uh, uh, you describe as a cycle and, and there are several uh, bodies of work that are described as cycles. 
that suggests to me also the idea of, of movement, uh, not only, uh, well, in his traditional historical painting in um, the movement of a narrative, but uh, in your work, uh, movement uh, bodily, but also mentally, uh, intellectually, through the space of, from one to the next uh, and so on. And uh, I think that's an interesting way to think about uh, painting as a sort of a collective activity uh, in terms of, you know, your surroundings and being immersed in, into a painting. Well, I love that idea of a collective activity. And I think that um, I think of um, the approach toward painting and into painting um, kind for me and the, the er, from those early drawings you showed to these more complex works of the early knots, aughts, and then the works that come later. But these paintings, um, which were far, part of my first show at the Walker in 2003 and my first show at a, a gallery in New York at the project in 2001, come from this, this idea of this immersive experience. Um, that's the, the reason the paintings are so large in scale and that the body has to have this kind of one body has one experience of the image, but you only can look at one part of the painting at a time. And other people have very different experiences to those paintings and a different kind of palimpsest gets made through your experience of looking and through one's experience of looking. But I love the notion of the collective and I think that Part of the reason that I use so many archival images in the way that I do and, and think around the idea of social space and the architecture is kind of a metaphoric way of, of, of signifying that type of space, social political space, is that um, that is a, a, a form of a collective knowledge. It's also, in, for, it also in, formed by an intuitive kind of, um, I think of intuition as kind of operating in the same place of this kind of collective congregation of resistance, if you will, like a space where there's an access to something else and a form of interconnectedness that is that is fundamental to particular types of experiences that we have. So I, I really think that that these paintings, just in the way that you experience them, but in the materiality of what they're made from is from this kind of collective and communal experience. Rucheka, would you like to add anything before we move to the next oh, gallery? I mean I was just listening quite rapt, actually, Julie, just <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> um, no, I just one, realized yeah. something. What? I just realized something also, like, maybe the three of us also being immigrants and being in these spaces, you know, and having immigrant and mixed, you know, families and sort of consistently our own positionalities being sort of confronted with these spaces to be both outside of and within simultaneously, um, the kind of shifting of having a focus in one area, not being able to, I mean, just doesn't, it's not kind of mm -hmm. physiologically possible to kind of exist in these places yet being constantly within peripheral vision yeah. is out of well, focus. Absolutely. And I mean, I was thinking when I, when I first heard kind of this, when you started off, Michael, talking about kind of the current moment that we're in and of course, the current moment that we're in is extremely fraught and extremely unique in many ways, but it's also of a piece and of a continuum with many, many, many moments. And I think right. something that, you know, I remember kind of first seeing Julie's work in, in, in the early aughts um, and first learning kind of about um, some of the similar similarities in our biography. I was born in Zimbabwe. My mother is from Zimbabwe, I came to the US as a young child. My father is English. As Christine said, we have shared kind of, all three of us shared experiences in some ways, but I remember in the early aughts seeing the paintings and being really like, wow, this is a person, and I had, didn't know Julie at all. I was a, I was a fan from afar. Um, I was in, like, in school, but this is a person who kind of understands the givens of a person like me, that you might be, have been born somewhere in a certain culture, that you might grow up in a different culture, that there's not necessarily like, conflicts between those things, but it's also not like a perfect belonging either. And that there is like this third thing that comes and maybe a fourth and a fifth and a sixth thing. Um, and the ways in which you interact at school with your friends might be different from how you interact with your cousins, from your parents, from your grandparents, just because you kind of have all these different modalities that are encompassed within you. And it's not necessarily a place of conflict or a place of dissonance. It's a place of kind of abundance in some ways. And I think 
that is something that I felt I felt very seen by in some ways by Julie's work, right? By kind of my own interactions with this person who I was like, oh wow, same, same, same. Um, and then to produce this really incredible, really ambitious, really kind of no holds barred work out of that experience that's simultaneously very personal um, and specific, but also extremely kind of cross applicable across cultures, across experiences, across the specificities of one's individual life um, and history kind of simultaneously. So yeah, when I think of positionality, I, that is something that I have long kind of loved about Julia's work and really felt kind of the embrace of it. And that I think, I'm sorry, Julie, please. No, I was just to add to that. I think that's actually core to why also the paintings um, insist on abstraction and stay in abstraction, even when there are really clear quotations and reference reference to the to many parts of the built and and, and um, the world around us. So, th but this kind of the the kind of multi dimensional, multi perspectival. Um, dynamic of the paintings and of the way that they're made and the kind of massive amount of information that gets layered and folded into the paintings is actually to kind of play with kind of even concepts around positionality and to be able to even challenge and interrogate some of that, some of the precon preconceived notions of of where an experience starts and how an and how one understands and knows a space or a time or 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 a or a historic narrative. So all of this gets kind of folded in on itself. And I think that's in addition to the scale, that's really part of the intention, I think, with the, the earlier work, especially, but also on the insistence in abstraction in general. And and and, and going back to something we were discussing this morning, um, ideas of like Edward Glisson and this idea that we clamor for the right to opacity for everybody. That I think that um, thinking around what the, the, the possibility is an abstraction and it's illegibility in a way is part of the kind of space for invention and space for liberation, which I think is really crucial to anyone trying to practice and anyone trying to understand themselves in the world and how they how they engage with anything else. So these this work is made from that place, like any artist trying to figure out who one is. I think it also relates um, to, you know, Julie, you often talk about neologisms and the, the kind of development of, of language, you know, by putting words together to invent new language in relation to visual languages and abstraction and your invention of visual languages. And in the exhibition, Michael, where you have installed those four works on paper, I think from 2004, 2005, on the reverse side of a freestanding wall. Um, and of course, there's a relationship there. And these are so great because they, they almost are like, oh, excuse me, um, uh, a type of like legend or a key of the marks themselves. So for example, you know, back to this kind of immigrant history, you know, Julie, your relationship with a mark might be similar to my relationship with Korean in terms of spoken language, yet I understand everything when I'm in the room, right? And I can draw out these words that I recognize, and yet I assemble them in my brain, perhaps differently from a native speaker. I mean, actually, I am a native speaker, but my second language took over. But, but you know, this way in which you compose or you understand, you extract certain keys and clues of certain words and put together. And in that sense, in the practice of doing that, um, putting language back out there, in Julie's case, you know, these marks that get repeated in different places over, you know, that she comes back to later, but that really start with the early drawings um, as a way to kind of invent new, new words through painting, through abstraction. Right. Much of what you've just discussed uh, also has something to do with the more philosophical notion of time, uh, perhaps related to psychogeographies, but uh, the idea that in the the past contains innumerable possible futures, right? And that the uh, in the future uh, there is the future contains always already your past, one's past, and so there is that sort of compression of time that that I think one can sense in the work. I think it's something that you talk about in the catalog, but um, it is something that when you spend time with the paintings, especially when you get into this gallery, here we're looking at Black City on the left and 7X, 
of mercy on the right, um, that that time, that, that compression of time becomes even more pronounced for me anyway. Hmm. Sorry, Michael, are we, we're not seeing the, uh, pr there we go. Ah. You have the image on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so in terms of the compression of time, something else that I think about is connects back to some of the kind of technical elements of the work, the way you actually make, the, especially your paintings, Julie, thinking about the kind of importance of layers um, and the importance of building up a surface um, and kind of the way in which I think so much of like, you know, when you see it in on a screen, of course, you can't quite tell or you can't tell at all. You can just tell that there is, you know, kind of something behind the something else, which is itself just an idea around perspective. But when you're in front of them, you can see like the translucency, the kind of layers that have been laid down over and over and over again. And of course, for me, that's such a perfect analogy to thinking about kind of archaeology, thinking about kind of the way in which we excavate quite literally our history, the layers of the past to kind of reveal the ways that people lived in the past, the things that we don't know about our, our precursors and our, our predecessors, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always so curious, Julie, about how, if I, if I can ask Julie a question, Michael, if you mind. Please, please. About kind of how you came just how did you develop that kind of mode of working um, both in a kind of conceptually, but also even I'm so interested in some, even like the technical aspect of it. It's so laborious. It's so kind of idiosyncratic and unique to you. Um, so I think like, you know, I just finished reading Toni Morrison's Immersion again. And um, it's so, it, it's this book where she goes back, right? And she's writing in 17th century early time of this of when when the country wasn't even the formed country as of yet you know still kind of colonial space that was trying to negotiate who what it at what it could be and and all of every but every act every character in this novel is um is is her mining how how this how this really complicated contradiction contradictory kind of reality came to be which and, and the kind of immense violence that in created what we are in this country, how that came to be. But it was this ama in, an amazing amount of mining of narrative. I mean, I think my understanding is some of the, in order to really understand even just the landscape or what animals were here at that time, as opposed to animals that came later, she had to change part of a narrative from writing about a wild boar to writing about a, a bear. Um, and so this, this came through this kind of her really intense mining of, you know, um, ship manifest logs to um, to like the actual ge geological landscape at that time and the plants that were indigenous to this place. And I think what the reason that I'm bringing that up is I think that it's this it's this constant effort we do to try and make sense of our moment is by trying to get look backward to like um, to try and contextualize and, and understand this. And I think my work came from that place just in terms of trying to make sense of myself as an artist, coming from um, my background, um, having been raised in, where, where in the different places I've been raised with, the, with parents who were building this, very, who were these futurist kind of modernists, you know, in the real sense of the word, as a Montessorian, as Africanists, as futurists in terms of building and participating in the construction of this other future that they were trying to build that was completely co-opted and devolved into a type of, um, uh, you know, dystopic kind of reality. And I think we're still, again, that's really what happened in this country too in the la in this time that of my lifetime. And I think we're really feeling that um, today, especially with this Supreme Court nomination, but also just in terms of the, the bigger picture of what, what we're feeling in terms of uncertainty in this vertiginous time we're in. And I think like, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that this, that mining and that sense of trying to make sense of something and trying to put contextualize time and contextualize space, that was core to like trying to make paintings and trying to figure out. So if it started with one mark and then they became hundreds of marks, they became layered and on top of one another. They, they developed their own histories, their own narrative, their own space, sense of place. They interacted in this world that was constructed and that was embedded. No, there is no part of the built world that is not embedded with a certain kind of social political desire and in, and in, into and in, and in, in form of like um, tech, technology. And all of that is kind of forming is is part of this historic. 
um, background of the, the, the current con context that we're in um, as violent or as kind of um, utopian in its desires. And all of that, I think, kind of has always been the, the, for, the ground that I interrogate in terms of and try and like mine to make and to try and negotiate this moment or who I am at this time. And so I think abstraction allowed for a place to think about possible alternate futures where entropy had could could be a state where something else was still possible, where despite every effort of extinguishing or the effort to extinguish one and 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 dehumanize one, that that there's this kind of constant insistence on being and constant insistence on invention. And so where does that space, how do we find that space? How do we mine that space? How do we mine the break or, or move into the break to invent new dimensions? And I think like that's the space that I'm interested in. That's a space that keeps pushing me to try and invent new images or paint new paintings from that, with that kind of desire from this communal idea of experience into something else like possible futures. So your work has taken you uh, uh, to many cities, obviously, in exhibitions, but also you've worked in uh, Berlin. Uh, I bring Berlin up because we're looking right now at Berliner Plätze in the gallery behind me. Um, and, and that is a place that is so redolent with, uh, you know, memories in, uh, uh, of the recent past, but also ancient past as well. But uh, more, more recently, the Cold War, right? And, and those uh, reminders uh, of uh, uh, a violent past connected with um, ideas about uh, perhaps the the military industrial complex, which is something you were thinking about in the earlier painting I was showing Black City. Uh, how does being in another place where you are a stranger, you are a visitor, a tourist, affect how you experience that in relation to what you just said? Well, for me, it was, um... I think we always you get perspective on yourself and and um you know this was it, the first time i actually lived in berlin was in 2007. um we were in like uh, the depth of the depths of the iraq war at that time uh things were this was before the election of barack obama um president obama and um this was at a time where we were really fla flailing in this in this conflict and um, its illegality was made very apparent to everybody. And so being in Germany where the narrative um, that I had from um, being raised here and and how I understood the, the, the first war, world war, the second world war and the kind of realities of Germany d between those wars. And then the cold war and how, and, and what happened to this space and how you experience this city you have these preconceptions of the, of what Germany is and what and and who Germans are in a way, and then you experience this city that has been where every scar is apparent. Every uh, it's a suitored city. It's completely tying together from like the, the the massive amounts of bombing, but the amount of violence that's there. I mean, you can go to um, deportation camps and extermination camps right outside of Berlin, and as well as in the middle of the city, you have the Holocaust Memorial, you have the, the markings of where the wall was, you have corners of many, many corners of every plot that were bombed, and you see the new construction versus the old construction and the old homes that were built at the turn of the century. These are all buildings that are drawn into here that were, most of them were um, bombed and destroyed, but this was an image of postcards of all of these very important kind of corners and plazas in Berlin. Um, that were built around the same time. And it was a form of like an idea of early, early pre-modern kind of, I mean, but this er early modern kind of desire of what, 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 could, what, what, could, what could be in Berlin. And I was interested in the kind of, the, the painting is, um, there's a reflection kind of of every drawing, every photograph that was um, traced and drawn into the painting is reversed. It's drawn also upside down. And so you have this very kind of subliminal almost um, different kind of experience like a mirage that you're feeling when you're in front of the painting. It's again a very vertiginous experience because the way that the lines move you actually have a, an optical kind of illusion where space actually seems to fold in and out of itself as you move through the painting. All of this was coming from me trying to digest and understand being in Berlin but actually to understand the contradictions inherent in being in this city 
that actually was similar to like you could think of New York City that did not want to go into the direction that this country went into, but yet many were complicit in where that country went and in the atrocities committed by where that country went. And I felt as an American in Germany, how complicit and, and, and how do we take responsibility for this horrific war and the thousands, hundreds of thousands of deaths and the destruction that we were causing you know, illegally, essentially, in the global context. And how do you take responsibility for that, even if it wasn't of your making, but, but, but by being a citizen of that context? And so to me, those, that type of perspective, that type of lens become, that's one of the really most interesting things about experiencing elsewhere and meeting elsewhere is how, do, how that also changes how you understand yourself and um, notions of what you, you know, take for granted or, or preconceptions you have that are way more complicated. But I think it's just really about getting to know the world and yourself in it, you know? There's also that, that um, physicality, it gets carried into not just the, you know, the, the upside down, the depiction, the compounding. I mean, we talked about that with Epigraph Damascus and how there's just so much in there, but also in terms of the layers um, and having marks that are embedded, that are fossilized, that are kind of frozen inside of the canvas. Um, and in other cases, marks that get erased, but whether they're um, essentially erased or invisibilized or that they're um, uh, kind of rendered opaque and not visible through the layers, that that doesn't mean they're not there. That that's kind of always within the, the, the compositional matter of identity of a city, of a person, of a civilization. Totally. And that these images are both receding and emerging at the same time, uh, like memory to me. It reminds me of uh, one of the thin cities in Invisible Cities, the Italo Calvino, uh, which is described as a spider web and the citizens understand that, it, that it's, uh, it's not going to last, that there's a, a moment when a new, a new web, a new city will have to take its place. Totally. Uh, you mentioned Epigraph Damascus. Uh, oh, well, in my slide uh, show here, we have Mogama, the cycle. Perhaps um, we can spend some time talking about Mogama. Would you like to continue with uh, Epigraph Damascus? No, we can, we can, yeah, I think this is a good um, place in between, yeah. Good. Because it is uh, um, essentially a conflation of all these sites around the world, beginning with uh, Tahrir Square uh, during the uh, revolution in Egypt um, that uh, gave birth to what we call the Arab Spring, but also conflating uh, multiple sites around the world uh, across time, across decades. Um, uh, sites of uh, revolution, uh, social upheaval, uh, uh, sites that are um, incredibly important in terms of uh, change uh, and change of borders, change uh, in terms of displacement. Um, and of course, we are uh, so proud to, to have the second uh, painting. I'm looking at it right now in front of me. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but this seems to me, uh, the cycle, uh, the culmination uh, in your work, Julie, of the exploration of this compression of space and time um, in terms of histories and revolution uh, as they're reamplified in the present, as, as we're living through them again now, uh, would that be, is this sort of the, the culmination of that exploration in your work? Culmination of the exploration? Of, of your through architecture. Yeah, I think they're coming to the end of that. I think that the marks um, at the time, I don't know that, I mean, I still made um, several paintings using architectural um, language after this, um, specifically Cairo, um, 2013, after the Morsi um, was um, the second revolution, if you will, or the second coup, depending on your perspective. But the, the, the Mogama paintings were, um, I'm, I was working on another painting, Invisible Line, which is also in the show. Um, before I started these, and I was working on that during the square, during the during the revolution in Tahrir Square, and during the North African and Arab Spring of uh, 2011, and the kind of revolutions that became um, 
contagious and took, you know, you, you saw them light up all over the world, um, including here at Zuccotti Park. But these, these, um, the, so my interest was after I, after I was invited to be in Documenta, um, I had just, just, I was, I wanted to deal with this, the square, the kind of the idea of the square as a, as the plaza. I had made a lot of paintings that actually suggested this. And I think the, the monumental horizontal paintings that are all in the show all have like the central idea or suggestion of like congregation and this square and the kind of public arena of that space. But the way that the square was being actualized and used during this time, this place of public protest. And um, Nasser Abbat wrote this, uh, the architectural historian, um, wrote this wonderful piece in art form called Circling the Square. And what he did in this is he talked about the kind of historic intention of every single building around the square and how they become from these various def di different per um, backgrounds and different intentions whether, when, and how they were built, whether it was um, the kind of uh, modernist kind of post-war neo-brutalist building to like um, early Beaux-Arts type of um, uh, uh, architecture to Mamluk architecture, all of this kind of Islamic architecture, all this form that informed the, and, and, and he goes really in depth into each building. But I was super fascinated with this idea that that each of these buildings are built, you know, with this intention and with his desires. I spoke all architecture has this embedded in it. It's impossible to deny that. And that each of these squares, each of these public squares, each of these sites that have become activated in this almost repeat social action that in as in certain ways is as prescriptive and as 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 um, as as, as um, gets co-opted in, in as much the same ways over time. Like so, you'll see these intense revolutions, intense uprisings happening. I mean, you see it right now in Lagos, Nigeria, um, and the and the amazing protests that are taking place there. And 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 at, at the same time, things shift. Big changes can happen. Countries can break down and fall apart because of these types of protests. Or what we saw happen in Sudan, what we saw happen in Egypt over time, is the type of complete co-option. Or what happened in Addis Ababa and in Ethiopia um, from during my childhood. And I think my because of my past and because of that history, I was super interested in in that liminal space of the square and that and that breaking point when when one too many crimes has occurred that causes like what we're experiencing right now in Nigeria, that causes the kind of mass protest against police brutality. It was also what caused the protest to, 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 to spark in Egypt at that time. And I think like, um, and what has caused the massive numbers of uprisings and protests we saw all through the summer here. Um, uh, and I think that, that, that that's that been a condition of our time. Like it's been, it's the reason my family, we, the, the revolution took place and we left, it was a green revolution in Iran. I mean, there's all of this, these histories and these precedents of this kind of, but there's this continual kind of reversal to that form of collective action as a, as a people. And so my interest was, how do you study each of these squares? If, if certain ones like Tiananmen Square stuck out, um, the Zocalo in Mexico City stand, stand out. If certain squares are scenes of mass executions at the same time as scenes of this form of uprising and possibility. I wanted to kind of interrogate that and also the various forms of architecture and narratives and desire embedded in what the city was and, and what as a collective, who those people were in trying to reflect this other desire in that infrastructure. How do the, the marks challenge that and become something else? And all of that were core to like why I was investigating and trying to make these paintings. But what happened, I think, in the making of these paintings and the time-based experientiality, the kind of erasure and the marks and um, the different kinds of figurations and little parts of bodies that started to appear. I think that the drawing became more and more primary in a way that that this it, it started to really like leave the the kind of structure of the architecture and almost surpass it, become something else. And they didn't fully hear. I think they were still limited to the to the architectural drawing because when you see a scale of a window, that scales a mark. There's just no way around that. And um, I wanted, I think it was after they used that I really, and after painting Cairo that I really moved on to um, the, the invisible line paintings and then working on this print. Yeah, so these, you know, these, these um, the two smaller paintings, um, the being higher paintings and then the invisible uh, sun paintings um, the, the the gray ones, of which I made seven, I think. They're um, those come after the Mogamas, and and 
they're really this exploration of the marks and the kind of um, indeterminate gray space, the, erase, the space of erasure that you see kind of as a haze in the Mogamas, but they become much more substantial in these paintings. And these paintings and the later work, I think are during that, those moments are made during those moments of co-option, during the failures of those revolutions, during the atrocious civil war that broke out in Syria, during the kind of um, hideous kind of incapability of the rest of the world during the attack on Libya. This is the context that we were that these paintings were made in. And um, and also like I think a lot of like um, challenges, you know, the kind of uh, upcoming for energy into the next election. I mean, this, these paintings were finished 2014-15 and we were moving into the end of the Obama um, years and and, you know, some of the failures of that administration or capabilities on the international stage or some of the kind of losses or some of the um, and, and, and some of the kind of difficulties like the kind of um, impossibilities his administration faced in this country. I think there's also um, the social time I'm talking about. Sorry, Christine, not that that's what the paintings are about, but that's the social context in which they were being made. And I think that um, it's always important to look at the the dates of these paintings and really think about kind of what's happening in the world, not as as these are, you know, depictions of them, but in terms of, you know, we talked about before about kind of, you know, scrolling through images, news feeds, social media feeds, etc. And all kind of that makes their way into to our consciousness and specific to the Mogama paintings, you know, sort of the one of the things that I see is alongside the, how do I put this, the kind of evolution around the conversation around power based on Mogama, which is the, the, t the name of these government administrative buildings on Terrier Square that have, um, as I understand it, have really changed meaning from um, being a symbol of African liberation to then in the you know, 80s and 90s to being about uh, government corruption and bureaucracy. And then again, this symbol, you know, uh, the, the revol not one, but two revolutions in uh, 2010, 2012, kind of symbol of, of, of revolution again, and that those sort of shifts that happen in the same, in relation to the same architecture in the same place. But simultaneously, um, if you look at these two works on the freestanding wall, being higher one, being higher two, which you did in 2013, and in many ways was a, well, not a response, but you were going through Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. um, and you made these um, in Harlem, thus a different scale from the works that you had in the studio that you were not able to go into. But if you look closely at the images of the body there and the extraordinary kind of movement and gesture um, and almost like not a depiction of the body, but almost an imprint of the body. And I think of Klein, I think of David Hammonds, but Michael, if you go back to the Mogama, I think this is a great image of that. But if you go back to the Mogama, the one in the highest collection, which is the second one, correct? And yes. you look at the upper portion of that canvas, this is done in 2012, you see an emergence of a kind of ghost of a figure in that upper part, which then kind of then Sandy happens, then you're back in New York, you know, then then these more singular kind of single figures on, on the being higher canvases happen. So that there's this architectural, spatial, you know, political, and then, and then the implication of the body in that sort of moment in that transition, 2012, 2013 into 2014. I think it's really, what, what really allowed that to happen was the kind of turning away from the architectural drawing. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the reason I think the architectural drawing became so, became a limit. It, it, at first it was this kind of liberatory thing that could create and compress and collect time at, and space, at, in, in a, if you will. But, but it, and it always gave the idea of this like big system and, 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 and far perspective as well as kind of being immersed in something. But it, you always had a sense of um, this kind of distance from the image because of the scale of the architectural drawing. When the architecture disappeared, the marks could become as it could become a monstrous in a particular way, or we could can become um, physical or or suggestive of like the body or beyond. And and I think that that was that it was interesting how the architecture eventually. And I think the Mogamas being the largest, it was in the, the experience of making those paintings that the limit was really realized. At least I felt that in that. And I think, and I just tell tell you all that like it was really important from the beginning to reunite the Mogamas. They were shown yeah. the four of them together in Documenta, and then um, in London at White Cube, and then they 
dispersed and went into different museum collections. But really, you know, for all the reasons that you're saying, and you know, those of you who haven't seen the show yet, when you see them, this kind of extraordinary moment, both within the practice and then within the world, and to kind of be immersed in the space of these four panels is quite an extraordinary experience. Maybe once in a lifetime, or maybe fourth well, time in a lifetime. Yes, <laughs> once in a lifetime over four moments. Right. Um, but I was also just going to say that I think that the thing about architecture and especially kind of architectural drawings is that they there's like an interesting relationship to to bodies and to people because of course architecture is made for us to be in but it also kind of you know we've all been in buildings where you're like wow did this architect like actually think a person was ever gonna like be in here because it doesn't really think that seem like they actually consider the real needs of actual flesh and blood humans and so i think there's it's an interesting like you know, is it a conceptual exercise or at what point does it go from that to being something that has to really house humans and be kind of workable? And so I do think that what you say is really interesting, Julie, about like kind of with the Mogamas reaching the kind of zenith of that and it kind of pushing you almost out into back out kind of cyclically back to the body and back to yourself in some ways, in part perhaps because of Sandy and because of the limitations placed on you by by that moment but you know what do you have you have your hands you have your own kind of scale of your own body and you have the canvas and i feel like the being higher paintings are so interesting because yeah like the hammond's body prints like eve klein other things we might think of they are really scaled when you stand in front of them they're scaled you know to your to an average height you know to an average height of a person and i think the hints of of fingers of kind of fingerprints of we know we don't know exactly, but we we can sense that it has this kind of different sort of connection, which then, in the works that follow, I think that just more and more is um, plays out more and more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, remember in the end, Julie, we were we had talked about this early on in working on the sh on the checklist, and we came back to them later. They kind of fell off the checklist because you know the editing process can be pretty brutal with as many works as Julie makes and then we put them back in and it really kind of you know ha we had this moment where we looked at it um and Rue you probably remember this also and it made so much sense to have these in yeah. they're different from the other ones but it really kind of connected things in a way that felt um that, that felt so and I don't want to say resolve because I think all of these in some way have a resolve but also just open up to new questions and new kind yeah. of I really think of this this kind of 2010, 11, 12 to like, it's like a hinge moment, you know? I think it's like there's connections to the past kind of decade of work and then there's connections kind of to right up to right now. Which no. is a good segue to the next gallery. Yeah, it's a segue I'm sorry. gallery, yeah. no, for sure. And I think it, it just to add to that, I think that um, part of that also comes from the experience of starting to work on the survey with Christine, um, because we started at that, around that time. And yeah. it, was, it, it was actually in this process of looking back through the work and, and understanding like how certain things were really investigated and pushed in the work and what wasn't and how, and what are the spaces like somehow, I don't think it was really planned, but I think now that I have this bit different perspective, I can see that there was almost this imperative to have to like push certain certain aspects in the work that I really wanted to investigate that I think were limited. And I found, and I realized those limits in this kind of backward gaze, if you will. Yeah, that's such an interesting, yeah. I mean, I think the experience of putting together a show like this for, as a curator is a really incredible experience, but it's also like, oh, like interested, let me see what you've been doing, but it's for you, it's like, I made that, let me think about the person that I was that I made that and let me think about the person I am now and the person I will be and want to be. And I think it's such an interesting totally. kind of, it must be a really kind of interesting but also kind of like scary, kind of like, you know, very. Really instructive. And I think what, yeah. what, what we really insisted on and I think it was great that both of you, all of you supported this is that the, this last room that we're in now um, would be able to, we would save space for unrealized works. And that's not yes. common in, in surveys, but I think I really um, wanted that. And I think it's really important. A lot of, a lot of 
the surveys that you see, the, the, you usually have just a couple works if there are any current works. And I think to really create a space, and there was a big space in all of these venues created for the, for the works made it right at the end that weren't even, we waited, we kept spaces in the catalog for them to be photographed. Mm -hmm. They were really like had not been shown before being in, in, in Los Angeles. I think that's like, um, something that we really always thought about, but I was always thinking about in the making of these works. So if we, I was working on the Invisible Suns while we were started to work, I was working on those other projects and each of those pushing them even more to this. And so I don't feel like the last room of paintings in this show is a ending of the show in any way, but it feels like, I mean, this show that's about to open at Mary Goodman Gallery is a continuation of some of that, some of that cycle or some of that, period of work. And so it's this kind of open, open or portal into this other possibilities. And, and to me, that that was um, how looking back in through the work offered this place for that, for that invention of that kind of new portal, if you will. And I think, um, you know, Michael, something that you really were able to do in the design of the exhibition at the high was when you came to LA, you really uh, kind of recognize um, and you spent time with the kind of the elliptical, how do I put this? Like in every place that you stood in the exhibition at LACMA, you could get these different sight lines of, of what's to come and what right. you've come out of. So, and we, we did that because we wanted to create a type of space of kind of hovering um, that happened at different tempos. So for example, where the early cycle of dispersion, renegade delirium and, um, the title of the third one uh, in that for the, the first Renegade. Re Retropistics. Re Retropistics, exactly, the Crystal Bridges painting. We, we nicknamed that room the Vortex. Um, and it was, you know, a, it was a box and it was the doorway was at a slight angle. So you kind of constantly felt this, this rotational movement in there. Um, and then when you were outside of the box, you know, you could see things like, for example, the orange in Condrick Parks Ferguson, um, or the orange in Hainini. And when you pivoted and looked at the early work, you see that in apropos. Um, so while at a glance, a viewer may think, okay, the recent works, you know, explosions of, uh, you know, highly saturated color, airbrush, spray painting, loose gesture, liberation, graphic marks, silk screening. And then you look at the early works and you might think, you know, tight lines, mapping, you know, stratified layers, smaller scale. Um, but really in creating a design, and you're able to do that using your own architecture, um, both Renzo Piano buildings, ours and yours, but, you know, in- And, in, and the Whitney. And the Whitney too, <laughs> but this kind of like the ability to have a circularity um, yeah. at the same time as a, as a linearity and, and, and trying to have these moments where, you know, sort of like the being higher bodies where there is a kind of hovering and not quite being in, in one space, you know, at one time. Absolutely. I find myself in your exhibition in Los Angeles, Christine, always looking back. It reminds me of the painting in the exhibition, you know, looking back to a bright new future. In a way, there's always this kind of redoubling and looking back to look forward, which uh, I'm really happy that we're able to, to achieve in, in our plan, uh, which is, well, the work is glorious and your exhibition was absolutely glorious as well. So I'm glad that we could do it justice here. But the, the last gallery is you think uh, when you get into this space where I'm standing and, and before uh, the Mogama cycle, you think this is like the, uh, the, the climax of the show. But in fact, when you go to the, 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 in this penultimate gallery, when you go to the last gallery, it's actually uh, even greater kind of climax, I think, uh, because it is a new beginning. It's like uh, closing the circle in a way where we didn't talk about this uh, uh, in terms of the earlier work, but uh, the idea of radical abstraction in the early 20th century and how that was important in Julie's work uh, and how in this new abstract work, um, the idea of a radical abstraction uh, uh, closes that circle in a way, I think really beautifully. We, um, we wanna take some questions. Sorry to break it off uh, uh, so abruptly, but I wanted to also just talk about one other aspect of the exhibition, which you won't see in the exhibition, but you can see it 
when you go to our museum shop and buy the catalog, that is the catalog. And uh, I have some uh, images of the catalog and um, the, the co-organization of the exhibition was such that the Los Angeles County Museum of Art took care of the logistics of the exhibition and the Witt Museum uh, produced the catalog. So um, Rajeko, can, may I turn it over to you to talk about uh, how the catalog not only documented the exhibition, but added substantially to it. Yeah, of course. Um, so yes, the, of course, it kind of goes without saying that an exhibition of this type, a retrospective mid-career 25 years of work would have a catalog. Um, but I think what doesn't always happen is that you get to have the opportunity to kind of do the catalog. Julie had many books um, that had been done by galleries and other institutions, but she had not really had this like big kind of overarching encyclopedic resource to be used kind of for future generations of scholars book. So that was, I think, something that we really wanted this to be. We really wanted it to become a definitive kind of, you know, piece of her practice moving forward, something that would be a resource for her as well as obviously for our institutions, but as well for people in posterity moving forward. So um, we kind of knew we wanted it to be scholarly. We wanted it to be really beautiful. We wanted it to be illuminating as to Julie's practice, the things that go into it, whether that be her kind of things she's inspired by, art history, political events, um, social events, her peers, you know, her kind of own history, of course, her own kind of self reflecting on her own practice, et cetera. So yeah, we put together this really amazing book with a really incredible um, table of contents, including um, an almost annotated bibliography chronolo chronology that Christine wrote looking at four different kind of sections of over time of Julie's career. So the page that we're looking at right now, the spread we're looking at, um, accompanies one of those sections. And so the way we thought of this was um, those of us who have the great privilege to spend time with Julie um, and to talk to her know that she reads, she looks, she's always got a reference. She's always talking about this song, this album. Have you read this? Have you seen this? Did you read this article? Um, and there's so much that goes into these paintings that I think people often aren't fully aware of. So we, this was an opportunity to pull out some of those references um, these are kind of end papers, but we can go back to the, to the kind of the, this one, yeah, the tiled one, just because I think just to even look at this, I think gives you, there's four different spreads like this, all with different images, but we have David Hammonds, we have the Click Club, we have um, Read My Lips, we have, you know, Lola Flash, um, we have Just Above Midtown Gallery, um, This Bridge Called My Back, we have Expo 67, Velasquez, all these really incredible references that are all kind of there. We have, of course, Freestyle, the cover of the catalog that um, is impossible to find at this point. <laughs> if you have a copy of Freestyle, hold on to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely $100 on Amazon. <laughs> I, yep. You're kidding me. I gave it to a student and they, oh, I, le I lent it. I lent it to a student. <laughs> you should, I mean, chalk it up that you're, you're welcome. That's what the student, yeah, that's the, the correct response. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's such an incredible insight into Julie's practice and into the things she's interested in. Um, so this is one an important aspect of the catalog. We also, of course, had kind of, we commissioned essays from um, Fred Moten, from Adriana Campbell, from, I wrote an essay from um, Leslie Jones um, at LACMA who works specifically in the printmaking um, department of curatorial department and spoke about kind of Julie's practice as a printmaker. Um, I'm trying to, Matthew Hale, who is both an, a writer and an artist as well as a friend of Julie's. So we kind of had this really interesting mix of um, people who knew Julie and could speak to the kind of, of course, the work, but also there was kind of a personal connection. And then people who maybe like Andriana, who just is an art historian, kind of a young art historian who we thought could do really incredible work by comparing Julie's work to other abstract painters of her generation. Um, Dagmawi Wubshed's another person who um, wrote about Julie's work in relation to Ethiopian modernism. He is Ethiopian. And so we also were able to pull out some of the threads there that perhaps had not really been adequately explored, thinking about not just Julie's biography in terms of historical events, but also kind of this art historical um, lineage that she is a part of. Um, that you know that we had not adequately explored. So all in all, I think 
I mean, I'm very proud of the book and I know, I hope, and I mean, I think we're all very proud of this book and really see it as more than exceeding kind of the dreams that we had for it. Um, really beautifully designed, um, really like painstakingly designed, I would say. So if you see any typos, please don't tell us. <laughs> there are uh, any. Uh, just to add to that, something that um, not many people know, which is that someone who's been hugely influential to, to all three of us who we lost um, recently was Oquian Rizor, the, the thinker, curator, writer, who's done Documenta, Venice Biennale, I mean, you name it. Um, and before he passed away, he was one of the, the catalog writers for this catalog. And unfortunately, um, there wasn't enough time, but what he was working on was a piece on the, uh, the violence of the colonial sublime and um, specific to uh, how Eon one and two, which are the commission works at SF MoMA that hang in the lower lobby, which are extraordinary um, uh, compositions um, that take uh, images from color from, I mean, just so many different histories around um, Hudson River School, thinking about westward expansionism, um, manifest destiny. And in all this, this beauty, and I'm specific to also um, the Bay Area and, and images and histories from counterculture, et cetera. Um, but then it really extraordinary, beautiful canvases, the inherent kind of violence in, in the history of this country, mm -hmm. in, in westward expansion, in, in, in landscape painting as we know it in this country coming out of Europe. And, um, and the reason why I bring that up and sort of reveal that is because I think that these these spreads, as well as the you know the end pages and the front pages of of the catalog, which hopefully you'll all have a chance to see if you haven't already, um, kind of depicts these these constant collisions and contradictions and paradoxes of images that are you know kind of zoomed in close up, extracted civil rights you know co covers of art journal journals, political posters, and the way that they kind of come into our consciousness. Um, and they are from histories that are that are troubled, that are violent, that are beautiful, that are you know kind of extend the range of how we would describe any images um, in in the world today. And I think that that really comes through. I think it's one of the reasons why it's the New York Times you know best catalogs of 2019. Um, is in addition, and, and that's such a difficult thing. I, how do you design that? I mean, there's, there are the essays right. and commissioning the essays and who's writing about this and who can write about this in such a thoughtful way, which all of the writers did, but then in a des design um, to be able to convey this, and this is just one of the spreads, um, was so powerful and such a, such a pleasure and a joy to, to work on together. Absolutely. It's, it's funny, uh, it reminded me when I first got it, my hands on it, of Oakley's A Short Century Catalog because of its density and the, uh, the amount of scholarship and information that uh, added to that incredible exhibition. No I think we, we're, gonna, we're going to go into some questions now and I have to apologize in advance because I haven't taken questions via Zoom before so I'm gonna maybe need a second to figure it out. So one, bear with me one sec. Okay, thank you so much for uh, <laughs> bearing with me. Question, um, how would you describe your process? I think this is a question for Julie. How would you describe your process of deciding on which experiences you want to express on these vast canvases? For example, how do you know which landscapes, colors, or shapes from your mind's eye you wish to arrange and combine in the piece? Well, I think that that first, first issue is that there is no, I don't think, um, I don't work in a way that could wish for any of it. Um, if I could have wished to be a particular type of artist, I think it would be a very, it, the work would have materialized very differently. I never thought I would be making the drawings I was making in the 90s. And I didn't think that I'd be working with architectural language and learning how to draw with a ruler. I never thought that I would ever do that. So I think that, um, 
the, the work and the, and the conceptual kind of drive behind how you start to approach working and thinking demands and asks for certain kinds of ways of, of trying to uh, visualize and imagine something. And I think it's through that process that you experiment and investigate um, things. And, and through those investigations, new images kind of come to, to be. And so none of these paintings, none of them have a preconceived idea of what they're going to look like other than um, a kind of conceptual and type of information. So if I wanted to first, it was just learning architectural language and trying to collapse 2000 years of history or 6,000 years of history into an image. How do you do that? If you, if you, if I, how can you do that by layering these different forms of, of, of built, the built environment on one another and tracing them onto one another and compressing space and time in that way? Two, investigating the stadium or investigating the military um, industrial complex or Berliner Platz and these erased spaces or the ru or ruins, the contemporary ruins in Baghdad and Damascus and um, Aleppo and, 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 and actually looking at that, um, it, looking at the landscape uh, when I was working on the Howell paintings for the San Francisco, um, for the murals in San Francisco, that came to me from the, from the actual opportunity of these two walls in this cavernous built, uh, lobby where these two walls were facing one another, it almost like billboards or almost like the, these vistas. But if you if you really experience the West and you live in and you hike in California or you experience the national parks, you are climbing from vista to vista, looking across canyons at one another. That made me think just intuitively of the American landscape painting and how American landscape painting was so indebted to this kind of project. Um, it hap happened at the same time as the Emancipation Project. It happened at the same time as the kind of like genocidal project of the greatest expansion project and the nationalization, the, the creation of national parks. So this idea of creating this pristine environment out of like the, the, the creation of genocide, all of these contradictions kind of happening at the same time as the expansionist colonial project of the American, you know, uh, push West and manifest destiny in that, embedded in that. So all of those like layers of contradiction, those became, those helped me think of what images to go to. And so by thinking about those ideas, I started to then move to selecting um, particular paintings that felt really appropriate in that way. Um, and a, a church painting, a, a Bierstadt painting of the national parks, being able to embed that then with contemporary race riots that were taking place after extrajudicial killings of people of color in this country and this kind of re resurgence of this form of like violence that we were actually being able to witness because of cell phones. And so this kind of this layering of space and time. And so those images, the, the ones that haunted me the most, I guess, are the ones that come to me the most are the images that I would layer into those paintings. And all of that information kind of informs what something will be or how it will look. And it's an experiment. I mean, it's not, you know, I can, look at all these images of fires and one will be especially haunting. And I will, and when it's blurred and I look at that, it can, it's something else can emerge from that experience. And I think that's how those decisions are made. Um, but it, I mean, over 25 years, each of those decisions has evolved in really different ways, but it's always this investigation and this interrogation and this experiment. And, and it's the trying to imagine something else, trying to, trying to invent something else from within all of that. That, that kind of in the end dictates what, what you end up doing, I guess. Wonderful. Uh, we have a question for all three of you um, from an Atlanta-based artist, uh, Ruth Dussault. Uh, how might each of the curators and Julie connect to the aesthetics of Renza Piano in form or ideology, considering the exhibition will be shown in three buildings by piano? Well, I wasn't at the Pie Museum to install this show. You were well, virtually. Virtually, and and my and 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 Damien from my team was, and you guys, the team there was amazing. But I do know, I did notice that there aren't external windows in this space, which mm -hmm. every other single Renzo piano space I've worked with has had windows and screens and or skylights that have to be covered and shadows and lines thrown everywhere. And it's Renzo Piano's way of drawing in the exhibition space and kind of claiming the exhibition space in this other way. And I think the High Museum and the Menil Museum are two, it's two places where I haven't witnessed that, where the light actually works really well in both those institutions. But I do think 
that at a certain point after Lorenzo Piano started to make more and more um, art museums, there became this kind of like interesting kind of challenge and um, dialogue, but also like kind of this, this effort at like making almost really drawing all over the work, all over the space. So these are Renzo Piano drawings by light and shadow. Every space. <laughs> the master of light takes over the space with that, colonizes it. So activist yeah, architecture. This will be my fourth Renzo Piano space because I also showed in one in Botin in, at the Botin oh. Foundation mm -hmm. in Spain. So they're definitely a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I had not put together actually that the high was also a Renzo Piano building um, until we were talking earlier. Um, but it's interesting when thinking about LACMA versus the Whitney, one of the things that, you know, the Whitney has a lot of, or the new Whitney, I should say, the downtown Whitney, mm -hmm. um, has so much kind of flexibility in the galleries. Um, we can kind of create kind of bespoke spaces in a lot of ways. Um, and it was so interesting to kind of LACMA, it's, it's a Renzo building, but it's a Renzo building in LA, which means earthquakes, which means very specific kind of limitations and restrictions around what you can do in the galleries because of the needs for safety yeah. and how, of course, how expensive that becomes. So it's kind of, and of course, yeah, the incredible skylights, but you know, like what doesn't love light? Paintings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, both from this like activist, you know, drawing in with light, but also from of a conservation point of view. So it's it's like this interesting, like we love to have the light, we love to have the windows open at the Whitney, but it's also this constant battle with the light to get the light levels low enough that our colleagues in conservation are like, and the people who own the paintings, of course, the lenders, so they're not going to just totally freak out that we're not taking care of their paintings, but but you also want the light. So it's kind of this push and pull, which I think is, is uh, yes, across the buildings that Renzo does. You see this push and pull. I do think that there, I, I will say also that the, the, the building in the high is actually, I've actually drawn that before in, um, because it has this spiral kind of generator dynamic that happens with um, the, the circular part of the building that, and so the aerial views of that, like Tadaando buildings have this mm -hmm. very particular structure that I was um, interested in. Um, but I do think that um, that the conversation between um, actually um, taking that space conceptually is a very different conversation. And I don't think it's, uh, we can get into it here, but. I really, I love the scalloped ceiling that you have. And I think that works really well. And one of the challenges that we had, and, and you know, Julia, I love that you, what, what did you say that, that these shadows that are created from these skylights become kind of his drawing or this kind of you know, information of something. It's taking over the space. No art and, can challenge that. Yeah, we have the skylight. So we have a, a ceiling that's glass that has a slight kind of, um, you know, kind of art barn like top, but then on top of it, this, what do you call it? Like a razor roof. So there is some control of light, but the light really came down from the top and it felt like a lid, third floor of, of a building. Um, we don't think of Los Angeles as a vertical city, very much a horizontal one, but there was very much a lid. And so the scale of some of the paintings, um, I think the tallest painting is 15 feet high, either Venice, Hakka and Riot and the Mogamas. And, um, and so, you know, this is probably boring and tedious to a lot of people out there, but lighting is so important, right? So when you have all this extra light coming from the top, and you're trying to light it, trying to light the lower registers of the painting more, yet then you have bodies of the viewers then you know, potentially casting shadows on the work. It becomes this incredible challenge. So I'll just leave you with this. When we photographed the show, because of the, the light moving, of course, of the sun, it was like we had a 20 minute window when the light was perfect. And it was in the afternoon and we didn't have the, you know, the, the lines kind of going over the, the painting. But definitely something where the, those, you know, although the paintings and the artwork is fixed, you know, the light moves. And so there was a, definitely a temporality to, you know, seeing the show. Totally. We have a, one, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. No, please, Julie, I'm sorry. No, I was just, uh, I just noticed on the chat an interesting question that just popped up around the Mogami series. I don't oh. know if you see it. I don't, oh, there it is, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I'll read it. Uh, my question is about Magama. Julia, I loved your discussion of the square as a three-dimensional social space and its relationship to revolution, but also, of course, its dual valence as a fundamental aspect of planar abstraction. Do you see abstraction as necessary to revolutionary art? I wonder with this in mind if Red Square and the Russian Revolution, as well as the trajectory of Russian abstraction via Malevich uh, and constructivism are embedded into the Magama canvases yeah. or other works. How do, you, uh, how do you understand your notion of, of abstraction to the history of, of abstract painting? I like the layeredness of the question. And I, and I think that um, with my earlier work in terms of the kind of uh, representation of space as this kind of geometric, flattening geometric space, um, you see that I can use just as a guide for how we understand that you look at, think of an airport map. When you look at a map on the back of an airplane catalog to tell you how to negotiate an airport, it's usually like a geometric space and it, and it marks numbers as to where the gates are. But it's this very abstract idea of space and idea of how we negotiate that. Those same geometric spaces and that same kind of geometric kind of mark uh, thing comes from, I think, and I think of these kinds of paintings that you're talking about, whether it's um, the constructivist paintings and, and Malevich and, 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 and the, the Russian abstractionists at that moment, the futurists and how they were thinking about that. But I actually think that, uh, that uh, so I think that abstraction offered at a moment this kind of desire for a particular kind of utopian desire in, in how one could envision and kind of build a world. And one, I just wanna say when I was in Moscow and I went to see the, the, the work in those museums and I was amazed by how much that aesthetic and how much that intentionality of that work was co-opted, right? Completely co-opted to the point where you have mass industry using that language right now. And that's always what happens to visual language or what always happens to these kind of efforts and these endeavors. And, and so I think when you ask the question about abstraction as being um, how, how fundamental is abstraction to revolutionary art, or I, I, I don't wanna kind of de uh, uh, define or delineate what revolutionary work can be, but I definitely think abstraction is revolutionary in that Abstraction, because of its illegibility, because of its kind of experiential dynamic, because of its referential aspect to how many forms of history and, and cultural language it calls from, uh, that and, and, and because of its um, uh, unbeing able to defi be defined in a way, it just offers different types of portals and, in, and, and possibilities. And, it offers this form of libertarian space, libertarian space that I think is crucial to like any type of revolutionary gesture. So in that sense, I think abstraction is really furtive for that work. I don't think it's, I, can't, I, I would hesitate to call anything necessary because I actually think the minute you, one says that it's a limit or uh, creates a kind of uh, a, a boundary around what, or, or, or some kind of like requirements as to what revolutionary can be. And I think actually, the, the, the constant like emancipation of that concept is important and the constant kind of capability of the kind of revealing of that. Like, um, you know, Fred Moten talks about the constant kind of becoming of the fugitive or the, kind, the constant kind of uh, freedom or allowing a uh, revealing of the fugitive is, is kind of, is, is always what is important. So I think that, and necessary, and that's what should be venerated. And that should be like, that uh, that doesn't that works against any concepts of what should be necessary and what are requirements for that. Wonderful. Um, I can't say anything uh, that could ever be as interesting as what you just said. So, uh, and given the fact that we are at the end of our time, I would just like to thank uh, Julie, you, Rajeko, Christine for your incredible observations and uh, knowledge and ideas that you brought to this presentation tonight. Thank you so much. This exhibition uh, is on view uh, for the next day tomorrow. It's uh, on view for members. It was on view today for members and will open to the public on Saturday, October 24th. So uh, please uh, start coming tomorrow morning. And for those of you who are watching who live in Fulton County, 
Remember, we're an early voting site here at the High Museum, so come vote early, and then you get to get to see this exhibition. It's a twofer, you can't beat it. So from all of us at the High Museum to all of you, uh, thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so Bye -bye. much.